I just want to start by reading a passage in your hearing. This is from Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, picking up from where we left off uh, last time. And we're going to read from verse 12 through to the end of the chapter, and, and it reads as follows. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, his body burst open and all his intestines filled up. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field in their language Acheldama, that is, field of blood. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they nominated two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justus, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots and the lot fell to Matthias, so he was added to the 11 apostles. Um, so when I was about 10 years old, um, I went to school one day as normal, I was dropped at school and we were in the playground uh, before class and I went up to one of my friends and he just ignored me, uh, like he, he failed to acknowledge me at all. And so it was a bit strange, but I went to another friend and he did exactly the same thing. And so now I'm realizing some, something's up here, this, this isn't right, something's happening. Uh, but then we had to go to class, the bell rang, so we went to class and, and we were in class. Then we had our first break. Um, went out into the playground and I went to play with my normal group of friends. There were five of us used to play together every day, but they were all ignoring me. I mean, like literally, literally turning their backs on me, not letting me play with them, not saying anything, just kind of not acknowledging me at all. And I was trying to ask them, what's going on? What's happening? What's going on? But I literally couldn't get anything out of anyone. No one even acknowledged that I was there. And, and I was confused because yesterday, Everything had been as right as rain, totally normal. We'd all been friends for years since the start of school and I hadn't done anything to anyone. And so I was really baffled. And so we, we went back into class and then after the lesson finished, we went back out, second break time, and exactly the same thing happened again. And so back into lessons and then lunchtime came and literally the same thing. Like I can remember I was literally looking over like from the outside looking in, looking over at my group of friends, they were playing and I had been just frozen out. And when you're a child, or certainly for me when I was a child, this is like a huge thing because your friends are everything. And this is like a really huge thing. And so just before, just before lunchtime was over, I managed to corner one of my friends. He'd kind of, one of the girl gazelles that had left the pack. And so I, I, managed, I managed to corner him and I asked him, What's happening? And he was trying to ignore me still, but I literally had him in a corner. So there wasn't anywhere for him to go. And, and I could see that, that his resolve was actually kind of starting to break, like without trying to read too much into what was happening in a 10 year old's mind. It, it, I can remember it literally looked like maintaining this isolation policy was starting to take his toll on him. He was, he was feeling uncomfortable. And he said, look, okay, Tim said that we shouldn't play with you or talk to you today, so we have to ignore you. And Tim isn't his real name, names have been changed to protect identities, but Tim was my best friend. And I remember being like, so hurt and, and so confused, thinking like, 
Why, why would he say that? Why, why would you guys do that? And so this was at the end of break and then the, the bell rang and we had to go back into to the last lesson of the day and, and throughout the last lesson, I guess the temperature kind of towards me kind of thawed because the next day came back to school and everything had gone back to normal. And I really, really wanted to know why I had been frozen out, but I was even more desperate to be back in, to be included again. And so I never raised it with anybody because I, I didn't want to rock the boat. I didn't want to go through that experience again. And it was really strange. It's like we all just pretended that it never happened. And even as I was kind of reflecting on this experience as I was preparing for today, I could literally remember, I, I could remember all of the emotions that I felt as a child back then. It's like I could still feel those emotions rising up in me now when I was thinking about it. Because as a kid, like when you're excluded and people turn their backs on you and, and it's like you're not even there, even though you know that they know that you're there, it's like a really strange thing. And some of you maybe were more resilient than I was. Some of you maybe like that wouldn't have been a thing and maybe you wouldn't have been bothered about it at all. But for me, I can remember it was like so painful. I can remember exactly how I felt like as a child, that feeling of being like excommunicated, but it, even though it was just for one day. And that feeling has never left me. And I'm, I'm lucky enough to still be friends with some of the people that I went to primary school with. And so about a year ago, I was having a cup of tea with one of my friends who was a part of my friendship group, a part of that group of five when we, when we were younger. And, and we were sitting and we were talking and we were talking about school as you do when you see old school friends and we were just reminiscing. And I don't know what made me bring it up, but I said to him, you probably won't remember this, but there was this one day where you guys all turned your backs on me and you pretended that I wasn't even there and you just froze me up. And he said, I do remember that day. And I was like, really surprised that he remembered because just because something is a big event to you and something that like kind of really rocked you and was traumatic to you, it doesn't mean that it was a big event for everybody else. But, but he said, I do remember that day. And then he started to get, I could see in his face, he started to get a little bit like emotional. And he said to me, I've always remembered that and I felt really bad and I'm sorry. And we had like a bit of a moment. I can't really describe it, but we did definitely have a bit of a moment. We didn't really need to say anything else, but it, it was something like a moment. And I was really grateful for that moment that we had because it validated how I felt at the time. It was kind of affirming that I wasn't just imagining it or I wasn't just remembering something that never really happened or, or I wasn't just being like too sensitive at the time. And the experience back then, and we're talking like over 25 years ago now, but the experience back then and the conversation with him just last year, it really taught me some very invaluable lessons because I saw firsthand that it really hurts not to be included when all that you want is just to be included. It's like a really deep pain. And I also learned that when you actively exclude somebody, when you block them from being included, even though they want to be included, then that will also generate like a pain within you. And if it doesn't, then something might be wrong because it really should. Now, one of the things that people used to call Jesus in the Gospels, the, the biographies of his life, one of the things that people used to call him is rabbi. And rabbi literally means my teacher. And so to be a rabbi in first century Palestine, there is really only one thing that you need. It's not a unique philosophy. It's not a new teaching. The one thing that you need simply is disciples. <laughs> you need students, you need teachers, uh, followers, sorry, you need disciples. And so Jesus had disciples and we can often think that Jesus simply had 
12 disciples because of the 12 disciples. But Jesus actually had many disciples and from the many he established a select group of 12. And this was basically a strategic move because it's easier to invest yourself into 12 people than to try and invest yourself into hundreds of people, especially if you only have like a limited amount of time. But if I invest in 12, then that's 12 people who can also invest in 12 people, who can also invest in 12 people, and it has a bit of a cascading effect. And so picking up our story in Acts chapter 1, where we left off last week, Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, he has been resurrected following his crucifixion, and he has convinced his followers that he is the truth. Not that he has the truth, but that he is the truth. And following this, Luke, who's the author of Acts, Luke tells us that Jesus was taken up to heaven. And this is known as the ascension for obvious reasons. And witnesses have literally seen Jesus taken up with their very own eyes. And so following this, his disciples have gone back to the Airbnb that they've been staying in, in Jerusalem. And you now have the 12, except the 12 are actually now the 11, because Judas Iscariot, the betrayer, the traitor, is now dead. But you also, aside from the 11, you also have others. There are other people. And the description of the others that Luke gives us is actually really, really important. And, and this is the kind of verse, and I'm going to share it shortly, the kind of verse that we can often overlook when we're reading the Bible and just see it as like a throwaway detail, not something of any importance. But it's actually something that's really, really important. So first of all, Luke goes through, he says you have the 11, they were in the house, and he reels off the name of the, the 11 disciples, uh, Peter, Andrew, James, John, Matthew, all the rest. And then he says this, they all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So Luke includes women in his account of who is present. And those of you who caught the message about privilege that we shared a, a few weeks back, you, you'll remember that women aren't generally included in accounts of who is in attendance because of their social standing. But Luke tells us that you have the 11 who were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, just the work of good disciples, but they weren't the only ones. You also had certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus. And if you think that this addition isn't a big deal, I want you to look at what it says next. Luke says next, and with his brothers. So Luke here is referring to Jesus's blood brothers, to James, and Jude, and Joses, and Simon. This is James, the same James who would go on to be the head of the church and the author of the New Testament book of James. This is Jude, the man who would go on to be the author of the New Testament book of Jude. These were Jesus's half-brothers, his literal flesh and blood. These are men who would, would go on to be integral to the establishment of the church. But in Luke's list, of people devoting themselves to prayer like good disciples. You have the 11, those who are with Jesus all the time for the last three years. Then you have certain women, including Jesus's mother, and no doubt some of the, the other women referred to in chapter eight of Luke's previous work, the Gospel of Luke, where he refers to the women who supported Jesus and kept his ministry afloat with their resources and their money. And then you have his brothers who would go on to be leaders of the church. This sequencing is a big deal. Because what this says to us is that from the very inception, even before the inception of the church, the church consisted and was built upon female followers of Jesus and male followers of Jesus. They were both included. They were both absolutely fundamental. And so Peter, one of the 11, he gathers the, the, the believers together. It was around 120 people. And he says to them all, look, we need to replace Judas Iscariot. And it's important that we understand it wasn't Judas's death that caused this vacancy amongst the disciples. It was Judas's defection before his death 
that caused the vacancy. Judas had voluntarily chosen to leave the team. Peter says, look, we need to pick someone who has been with us from the beginning of Jesus' ministry, from the time that he got baptised by John the Baptist. And so the people propose a short list of two men. There is Joseph, also known as Bar Sabbath, literally meaning son of the Sabbath, and there is Matthias. And from this short list, they ask God to show them who his choice is. And the way that they do this is by a process called the casting of lots. Now, casting of lots is a process that sounds strange to 21st century ears. It's a process that we see often in the earlier portion of the Bible, uh, the Old Testament, wherein if people wanted God to, to make a choice, to, to make a decision between different options, if they wanted to see what God's choice and what God's will was, then they would get these marked stones and they would put the stones in a jar and they shake the jar and shake them out. And whoever's stone comes out first, that's who would be chosen. So I guess it would look somewhat similar to how teams are chosen in the FA Cup draw in football. The marked stones go in and they're kind of stirred around and whichever one comes out, that's the one that's chosen. And so to our ears, I understand that this can at best sound like a bit of a random process and at worst, it can even sound like gambling or something. But we must understand that throughout the Old Testament, this process was always seen uh, as, to, as being determined by God. And so they mark the stones, one for Barsabbas, one for Matthias, and they put these stones in the jar, and then Matthias's stone comes out first. And Matthias is added to the 11 disciples who are now incidentally known as the apostles, literally the sent ones. Now, when it came to selecting the original 12, they were all cherry-picked by Jesus himself. Like Jesus was walking along at the Sea of Galilee and he said to Peter and his brother Andrew, he says to James and his brother John, follow me. Or Jesus is walking past the tax collector's booth and he says to Matthew, follow me. He says to Philip, follow me. He says to Nathaniel, follow me. He picked them himself. He called them himself. But now the disciples feel that they can no longer rely on that same process because Jesus isn't physically here in the same capacity. So they go to a different process. They function within a different paradigm. They cast their lots. And this actually represents the last recorded time in the Bible that anyone ever cast lots. You see, casting lots was fairly common in the Old Testament, but here in the last verse of Acts chapter 1, here is the last recorded time that we see anyone using this process. It's used by the disciples to pick a 12th disciple, a task that up to now has exclusively belonged to Jesus. But what the disciples don't yet know is that this task still exclusively belongs to Jesus. Because the same way that Jesus made himself known to Peter and to Andrew and to James and John and the way that he personally cherry-picked them and told them to follow him, Jesus would soon make himself known to another man. And he would cherry-pick him. And this man would be the last man that anyone would ever expect to be cherry-picked by Jesus. This man is the last man that anyone would ever expect to be called to follow Jesus. Literally the last man that anyone would expect to be named as an apostle. And his name was Saul. And on another day, we'll look a little bit more into Jesus' act of inclusivity in inviting literally the most unsuitable candidate to be involved in a mission of the church. But for now, the disciples select Matthias to be one of the twelve. We've never heard of Matthias before, and we literally never hear of him again. I'm sure he was a, a good guy. I mean, he was shortlisted for his credentials. He was someone who was there from the beginning. He was committed. He was faithful. He was a good guy, I'm sure, but he disappears out of the story 
as quickly as he appears in the story. And this is the point about God and about his church and about inclusivity. You see, the apostles had a desire to be inclusive, to add to their number, to bring somebody in, to increase. And the way that they wanted to do this wasn't the way that God wanted to do this. Which means that the choice that they ended up making wasn't God's choice. But God respected their desire to be inclusive and was willing to work within their paradigm. So it's like God is saying to them, you want a new disciple? Well, so do I. You want a short list of, uh, of Joseph and Matthias? Well, they're not on my list, but they're good men. Okay. You want to cast lots to see who it should be? Well, I'm actually phasing this method out because I'm, I'm literally about to send the Holy Spirit who will totally make that redundant. But okay, I'll work with you. So based on your choices, none of which are my choices, I will work within this paradigm and I will show you an option that is acceptable and will work for you. Because even though this isn't the overall outcome that I am seeking to establish, I appreciate that inclusiveness is a value that is important to you. And I can appreciate that because inclusiveness is a value that is important to me. And it's a value that should be at the very heart of my church. Inclusiveness is, is a term that I'm sure you'll uh, see and feel is being used with increasing frequency. And it quite simply means to be open and accessible to everyone, to not exclude any person or any group. And the reason for the increased frequency of us hearing and being aware of this term is that more and more groups of people are being given the platform to vocalise the ways that they feel that they have been excluded up to now. How they've been excluded from society or how they've been excluded from the workplace or how they've been excluded from institutions or opportunities. And the church has always had a, a bit of an uneasy relationship with the idea of inclusiveness. Because on the one hand, there is a genuine and firm commitment to wanting everybody to come in, regardless of who you are and regardless of what your story is. But on the other hand, there is a firm belief that Christians owe it to God to strive to live a life that pleases God. And so the church has somewhat struggled to reconcile these two perspectives, sometimes successfully, sometimes more unsuccessfully. But as I look at this episode in Acts chapter 1, in addition to, to how Luke goes about including women in the schematics for the church, and in addition to the disciples' well-intentioned desire to include Matthias in their number, I see one more message about inclusivity and maybe it's the most powerful and maybe it's the most difficult to swallow. I see one more message about what inclusivity meant to the disciples and more importantly about what inclusivity meant to Jesus. You see when Peter stands up and he gives his speech about picking a new disciple, he reminds everybody as if they needed reminding that the reason they need a new disciple is because Judas, the former incumbent, is dead. Judas, the, the disciple who said to the leaders who wanted to kill Jesus, I will find out where he's going to be and then I'll personally bring him to you under cover of darkness so you can take him away and crucify him. That Judas. Now we don't know exactly when, but at some point, while Judas was still a disciple, Jesus was able to look at him and look in his eyes 
and see what was in his heart and know this man who is smiling in your face and who you have invested so much of yourself in is going to sell you down the river. This man is going to be harmful to Jesus. There is a great cost attached to including him. But Jesus doesn't throw him out. He keeps him in. I want to be really honest with you. As far as our church is concerned, I don't want to sell you some utopian fantasy. You see, we value inclusivity, but inclusivity can come at a cost. Being inclusive has the potential to hurt us as individuals and to hurt us as a group. Being inclusive has the potential to hurt our reputation as a church. But that's how it has to be. Because God hasn't given the church a choice about that. Jesus himself modelled the potential cost of inclusivity. But Jesus also demonstrated that the cost of including Judas was worth the gain of including Matthew, who compiled a gospel. It was worth the gain of, of including John, who compiled a gospel and recorded the book of Revelation. It was worth the gain of including Peter, who preached one sermon and 3,000 people got baptised. It was worth the gain of including Mary Magdalene, who left an indelible imprint on this community of believers and who financially contributed to, to driving the church forward. So inclusion costs, but it's worth it. If we at ACTS truly value inclusivity, and if we truly model inclusivity, it will cost us something. It might cost us some reputational damage as people look at us and ask about what we're doing and how we're doing things. It might cost us internal strife as we, we try to, to get to grips with things that are happening. But our mission has to be that every single person on the planet can feel that if I happen to be in Leytonstone on a Saturday morning when lockdown is behind us, and I happen to swing by this faith community in the library, someone will say hello to me. Someone will invite me to sit down. Someone will talk to me like I'm a human being with worth. Someone will say to me, take a selfie with me. Someone will, will offer me something to eat after worship, and someone will say to me, we genuinely hope that you can come again. We have a commitment to being inclusive. And if you've been wondering while I've been talking about inclusivity, if, you, if you've been wondering, well, who specifically are these people that you're saying we need to be inclusive of? Who are these people? Who are these groups of people that we need to be inclusive of? If you've been wondering that, let me say this to you. We pretty much all have some kind of unconscious bias against some people. Hands up, I know I do. We pretty much all have some form of unconscious bias or sometimes even conscious bias. And so if there is any person or any group who you would feel slightly uncomfortable sitting down next to and worshipping alongside, it's them. That's who we're talking about. That's who we're being committed to being inclusive to. It's them. And I can be honest enough to say, I don't know what that looks like in practice all of the time. But I do know that we have to try. Because I can remember what it feels like to be standing on the outside, wishing that you could be on the inside but nobody wants to play with you. There is one thing that I really respect the disciples for. 
You see, even before Judas betrayed Jesus, he was already a Roman. Because even before he did the big bad act that threatened to destroy the community, he was doing other things that were harming the community. We, we read in the Gospels, we read in the Gospel of John that Judas was in charge of the money. He was the treasurer. And he had been stealing money consistently from the kitty. In John, we read about a particular episode where, where Mary brings some expensive perfume for Jesus. And Judas is like, why is she wasting that? That money could have been sold and, and the money could have been given to the poor. But John said, we knew he was lying. He didn't mean that. He just wanted the money to go in a kitty so he could steal it. Judas had, Judas had been stealing this hard-earned hard -earned money that people were donating to Jesus to support him and to support the disciples, money for them to buy food, money for them to find beds for the night. Judas had been stealing it. And maybe he thought that as the treasurer, he could audit things in such a way that he could cover his tracks and people wouldn't know. But they did know. They all knew. John says it. He was a thief. His presence was causing issues for the group. But they didn't kick him out. Why? Because one of the core values of their group was inclusivity. Even when it hurt them, their core value was inclusivity. So as much as is humanly possible, we find ways to keep you inside rather than keeping you outside. The reality is that Judas wasn't the only Roman that Jesus invited into this community. Peter was violent. James and John were conceited. Matthew was a crook. Nathaniel was xenophobic. Simon was a terrorist. He'd say freedom fighter, but Pick your word. But Jesus knew that the love of God exhibited within a faith community is powerful enough to compel people to change. To compel people to become more like God. And for every Judas who turns his back and walks away because he doesn't want to change, there will be Peter's and James's and John's and Matthew's who become titans because they were included. Jesus reached out to drunks. Jesus reached out to people whose lives were considered sexually immoral. Jesus reached out to a career thief who, who happened to live in a society with capital punishment and was being crucified for his actions. Jesus reached out to the people who were killing him and the people who were cheering for the people who were killing him and said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing and I want them to be included. It will be really, really easy to make a case for excluding all of those people. It would be really easy to make a case for describing them as people in a sinful lifestyle, people unrepentant and committed to living this sinful life. Jesus still went out of his way to include them. Because that's the gospel. He went out of his way to include them in the same way, the same manner that he went out of his way to include you and I. In the same manner that he stands at the door of every person's heart, knocking. That if you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. Because Jesus is the model of inclusivity. And the gospel is all about inclusivity. We are invited in to the kingdom of God. We are included. And so one of the values that is chiseled into our spiritual pillar is inclusivity. Everyone is invited. Inclusivity 
doesn't mean that change isn't a part of a person's faith journey. Inclusivity doesn't mean that God doesn't want to see people leave behind old ways and adopt new ways. It means that in spite of any potential cost to us, we think that the gain will be greater. It means extending the same invitation to come into the fold that Jesus gave to Peter and James and John and Judas. Because if there's room for him, then there's room for everyone. There are people, both people who we know and people we don't know, for whom all they want is to feel included. But they've been left outside. Jesus is calling us to see and to understand and to appreciate the value of inclusivity.